it. But for me, that's the gist of it, you know, as it relates to music. Of course, on the other hand, had you, being the devil's advocate here, had you played football, you know, no. money. <laughs> you know what I found out? I found out. Um, I eventually wound up in Chicago because of Ellis. He went to do a master class at, at a university in Chicago. And he came back and he said, well, hey, man, what are you going to do after you graduate? He said, I don't know, man. I like history. I, maybe I'll be a history teacher. I just really didn't get it, did I? And uh, he said, history teacher. It's like, man, I'm talking about music. What are you going to so I didn't think about music, you know. Ellis is saying this to you. What is it? This is Ellis telling you this. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he said, look, you're not ready to go to New York because we, all of the other guys were had their eyes set on New York, like Winton and those guys, you know. See, you, you, you're not ready to go to New York. So there's this program in Chicago. And and I've asked the guy, well, he's he's going to set up an audition, and you can go. So anyway, that's that's what happened. I went and I auditioned, and I got in on a scholarship. And so I was in Chicago, uh, for two and a half years, and um, during that time, I got a gig with the Chicago Bears band. Oh. Yeah, Chicago Bears man. During the time of the championship team, that was the time with the refrigerator and all. Yeah. Yes, but by the way, what was your position in football? Running back. I was. I was. I wanted to be. I wanted to be Tony Dorsett. You know, I was a running back. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But but the thing is. Yeah, I, that happened when I was 10, and that put it into thinking about it. But sitting right behind the end zone and seeing those big-ass dudes that close, it, it, it wouldn't have happened. I would not have been a football player. Okay. <laughs> And would they would not, man's cats are so you know you see those those yeah. dudes are so huge they they're just huge I mean six five six seven you know built like two refrigerators all muscle yeah, yeah, no. it wasn't gonna happen so now you're in the Bears band at the at the games now you get this and that's the good Bears team right the oh it was great. It was Mike Ditka, Mike Ditka Bears, right? The yeah, but at that time they were pretty sad. <laughs> oh yeah, they were the saddest people. Yeah. Yeah. But I was there. I was there. Well, once again, I left before the '85 season. Uh huh. I left the gig because I pissed off the 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 uh, leader. Um, because I kept saying, "Man." I'm tired of playing. Can we play some new, new tunes, new songs? New <laughs> this cat. This cat was like, "No, this this works, Jess. It works." Don't. And so he got tired of me trying to rock the boat, and he said, "Hey, Jess, you gotta go, man. That's you know." But anyway, I I, I skipped to that to to see to say why. I I knew football would not be in the cards for me, um, you know. So, yeah, and so now, of course, Chicago has a uh, quite a thriving music scene. Absolutely. I mean, and absolutely, and it certainly did. Um, Chicago, I, it it was the right place to go. Did you know Von Freeman and those guys? Did you? I I eventually came to know Von and all of the Chicago cats. You know, the school was North Northeastern Illinois University, and uh, what was it? Uh, Northeastern Illinois. Oh, Northeastern University, yeah. And uh, 
So there were some guys there who knew a bit about the Chicago scene. And I made friends. I hooked up with this cat. They called him Smiles for obvious reasons, always smiling. But Chucky Anderson was a great trumpet player, flugelhorn, you know, and, and he he knew inside stuff that I never learned or never knew anything about. He knew stuff about Freddie and Miles and Bird and that. And he knew all of the best cats in Chicago. And and uh so he he had this beat up ass bug and and we'd be sliding all over the street in the winter, no heat. But man, that cat would take me to every gig, session, hang everywhere, and it was always constant music, constant playing, and uh, I did quite a bit of hanging out on the south side, and that's where Vaughn and uh, Chris Foreman was playing organ there at the other place. I mean, there were a lot of people, you know, um, and, and there were some great musicians that never really left the Midwest. Yeah, and, were, I, I noticed that too. When my first place I went on the road, when I joined Chet Baker was we went to for a week at the Jazz Showcase. Yes. We stayed at the Maryland Hotel. I remember there that. Across the street on Rush Street. Yep. And, and I met guys there like Tommy Ponce. Yes, I I I, I know him. I know you're talking about. You yes. know, trumpet and saxophone. I mean, Ira Sullivan, who was from Chicago. Ira, was Sull Ira was Sullivan was the the cream of the crop. Ira yeah. was my mentor. I met Ira when I was 13. Yeah. And so that was it. You know, so when I went to Chicago. I thought it was very unusual to play trumpet and saxophone. One night we were in a session and about five guys come in with trumpet and saxophone. You yeah. Know? Well, in Chicago, it's not a new, you got Eddie Harris. You got a lot of people yeah. who entertain those ideas, but our son And Wilbur was... Campbell and Jody Christian. Exactly. Jody Christian. Wow. That's did, you, did you get next to them? Did you? I got, I, Wilbur Campbell, no, but I played a lot with Jody Christian. Um, I used to I used to play in uh, in the band with Red Holt and the guys, the, you know the cats that that they played with Ramsey Lewis, uh -huh. Red Holt, Red Holt Young, and uh, you know they're famous for that uh, da 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 What's the name of that tune? Oh. Yeah, I can't remember. It a big hit. And I didn't even know that. But um you know Richie Pardo? I don't know Richie Pardo. Anyway, so you knew Jody. Yeah, I know all of the things. I mean he's a wonderful I mean, he, I, I would play with I got to play with Barry Deems. Oh, and God. and when he would I'm tell me about pops, office. yeah, he would tell me about pops. I'd just be looking at him like, wait a minute, I've seen videos, I've never seen. Yeah, I mean, look, Chicago, you know, I I it's a big part of part of the person I am as well now. Uh, Chicago was a great place to hang out. So Great you gigged point. around Chicago too. You you played some gigs and you got with your buddy. The I eventually over. I mean, I guess I was only there for what about two and a half years. Um, but I I got to do a lot of stuff in Chicago. I got to play a lot of gigs with different bands and different people. I got to do a lot of big band stuff. Um, and and. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a full experience, um, and but one day I woke up and uh, something just told me that I I needed to go to New York. I had no specific reason for it. I didn't think I could play or anything. It's just something just told me to go, and I woke up and I told my girlfriend at the time. I said I got to go to New York. And she didn't think I was crazy. She said, okay, 
Yeah. You going with Israel? Well, it, we eventually got to that, but um, I mean, so once again, I called Ellis. And uh, it just so happened that he had done a uh, master class at William Patterson. And he said, hey, man, you called me just in time. I just got back from William Patterson, and I think that's where you should go. Was Rufus there? Or Rufus, Rufus Root. Rufus right. Root was there. And uh, so I went and I auditioned and got a scholarship to go to William Patterson. And uh, I was at William Patterson. That's where I met Pete Bernstein, uh, Joe Farnsworth. Um, there were a lot of cats there. there. Uh, Eric Alexander was there a little later. But I was there almost, almost two semesters. What year was this, uh, just to catch us up to? 86. 86. Well, the beginning, the beginning, the, the, the latter part of 85, the beginning of 86, kind of. And uh, I was there for the first two semesters. And uh, Pete, um, well, he's a New Yorker like you, you know, and... and I came about, I'm not a native New Yorker like you. Okay. All right. Well, Pete's a native New Yorker, and... Uh, he said, yeah, man, I'm going in for the weekend. My my aunt and uncle are out. And, and so, you know, on the weekends, I kind of watch their apartment for them, you know, water the plants or whatever, you know. <laughs> he said, you're welcome to come. I said, shit, yeah. So, Who, and, who's, uh, right on. whose house was this? What was it? Whose house was he watching the... Uh... His aunt, aunt and uncle. Oh, he's not an uncle. Yeah, okay. Yeah, his his family, you know. And uh so we hung out and he brought me to like some of the sessions. And I don't remember if it was the village gate session or somewhere, but after it was done, this this cat came up to me, this alto player, and he said, Hey man, man, I like the way you play. Wow, oh, you you play bebop. I like the way you play. He's like, um, I play with Illinois Jaquette's big band, and we need a second alto player. Would you be interested? And I was like, well, I go to school in William Patterson, but, you know, if it wouldn't interfere with my school. Anyway, he set up an audition, and I went out to Queens and auditioned for Jacket, and I got the gig. And it was in, an incredible, once again, journey because the first the first week was at the Vanguard. So the band played a week at the Vanguard. And then the next eight weeks, we did the fest all the festival circuits. We we went all over Europe. We played all of the festivals. And it just it blew my mind. It blew my mind. And uh I mean, what, I think I was 20 years old. Um, and the alto player was Joey Cavasino. Joey Cavasino, I was just going to say, was Joey on the band? I was Joey, baby. And and Joey was, at that time, I think Joey was 18. You know what I mean? Because, you know, Joey was kind of like, like the prodigy. Like, since 12 years old, he could play like Johnny Hodges. And he used, he used to play with Doc Cheatham and Sammy Price. Yeah. All of those cats. And uh, yeah, he used to play the brunch. Where was the brunch? Was it at Sweet Basil somewhere? Sweet Basil with Doc Cheatham, yeah. He played with Doc Cheatham. And uh, so I, it, at the time, I didn't really get it. But it's quite amazing that a cat that young could, in the interest of, of Jacket's band, just like hook cats up <laughs> without a second thought, you know. Now he's doing that with hip hop. I know. I remember. <laughs> I remember when he told me and, uh, he was gonna do it. What is? What does he call it? Uh, what is his his name? He has a name for it. Yeah, 
Oh, I don't remember He's now. He's had a few health problems lately. But I know, fine. I know, I know. We, uh, I talked to him a couple of times uh, over over the over recent years. Cause I saw him in Escona once, and and uh, I had to leave, you know. But it sounded great as usual. Yeah, great awesome. alto player, great clarinetist as well. You know? I heard him do that, but yeah, he put out a record, a duet record that I did with a pianist named Tony Castellano. Ah, on his Soul Kid, <laughs> right? Which is. You know, very reasonable, fair deal to to, to everybody. You know, hey man, I mean, Joe's an alto player, yeah. and and he loves and respects all of the alto players. You know, so so you know, we used to fight a lot. <laughs> well, that's easy with him too. You know, I mean, yeah, I we used to fight a lot because because he 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 was kind of like the unofficial straw. And and it was like, look, man, stop telling me what to do. Straw boss, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> is sort of like the concert master. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, they say classical yeah. music. Yeah, and Joy, Joy will let you know, you know. But they were guys like I know you mentioned the other day, I think Irvin Stokes and and Virgil Jones and Eddie Bearfield. Bear was in yeah, Eddie Bearfield, man. Oh, Bear, a man. lot of people. He was Sonny Rollins was taking clarinet lessons with him. Yeah, Bear was Bear was everything, man. Bear was amazing, man. I didn't get to know him. I got to know him in the repair shop, Saul Fry, yeah. a couple times, but I never really got inside uh, him. Well, hey, Bear was amazing, and 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 what an amazing career. And he, he, everyone would ask him, they would beg him to write a book. I mean, he was there with Toscanini in the NBC band. Wow. Yeah, he was there for that. I mean, I think Joe Allard was in that band too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where he met Al Galadero as well. Right. Another great. Like a lot of those cats, you know. I mean, and uh, he he's an ama- he was an amazing person with, with the most interesting life. And uh, but there were so many in that band. There were guys in that band. Some of those guys played with McKinley's Cotton Pickers. Yeah, and shit, you know. So I learned I learned a lot from those guys, and and. Uh, yeah, but the two babies were me and Joey until Frank Lacey showed up. You know, I mean, that was quite a quite a talented band. And, and oh, it was a great band. Yeah, it and, was a great band. It didn't get as much play at home because you you had Buck Clayton's band. You know, I mean, Buck Buck Clayton's band was winning all of the Grammys and. You know, so and Hap was still out. He had Hap's band, and you still had had Woody Herman's band. You know, the Buddy Rich's band. Yeah, there were a lot of bands. There were a lot of bands, but but Jacket's band was special because that his book, the repertoire, covered the entire, almost entire history of the music. You know, um, I mean, so we had moments where we'd be playing somewhere and like like Dizzy would sit in with the band um, and we already had his music, you know, stuff like that. I mean, it was amazing. And and to, to, to just sit and watch Illinois Jaquette work his magic. As a as a, as an entertainer, as a showman, but but as a musician, what an amazing musician! Wow, you know, but they called him the Beast, and <laughs> yeah. He well, you know, he kind of was to me. He was like an actor who got typecast. Yeah, away from that jazz and the Philharmonic stuff. Right, right. People just thought he was like a honker. Yeah, you know, that's he went right. 
would engage in those you know, know. crowd pleasing. Well, they, they were sadly mistaken. They were screaming like it was the Roman Coliseum. The audience would be if you listen to those then, That was his bread and butter back then. But you know, he, later I heard and I heard how he played ballad so sensitively. Uh, could... Jacket was anything but just a hunker. Yeah, I mean that that shit made him famous. He was a, he was a superstar. One solo, flying home. Home. That was... I mean, it took him to, to Hollywood, where he worked with Nat King Cole and worked with, I mean, I mean, but but that dude could play, and he used to stay on my case. Really? What, what was he? He'd just say stuff like, yeah, Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker, well, bird, bird. I remember when I was playing with Count Basie's band and our bus stopped at the truck stop and Bird's bus stopped. I went and banged on the door. Tell Charlie Parker. <laughs> he said he kept challenging Bird to, to a duel. And uh, I mean, Bird was scared. A musical duel? Yeah, outside the bus. Bird was scared, you know. Because he, he's a great alto player, too. Wow. I played the shit out the alto. You heard him on the I never heard him on alto. No. Yeah, he used to play on the gig. He used to play um Sunny Side of the Street and some other stuff. And uh he could really play Bebop. Really, you know. So now you're playing with him and you're also spending whatever time you're not on the road, you're living in New York now. Uh, or you live in Jersey, or you know. You no, know, no, no, no. I, I after, that first, after that first tour, and and you know the first time in my life, making twelve hundred dollars a week, uh, the band came back from Europe and got into JFK, and I said I'm not going back to New Jersey. I'm going to stay in New York. So I moved to New York, and uh, so. Uh, that's when I found out about the new school. And I, I enrolled in the new school because I wanted to finish school, but it wasn't an accredited program, so it was just a nice hang. And Arnie Lawrence, of course. Oh, Arnie was there, of course. Dear Arnie. Amongst many, there were so many people. And uh, so, yeah, I, I decided to stay in New York, um, in Manhattan, and you know, shortly thereafter, um, I I started playing um, with Junior Masters Trio, um, and and Chico Hamilton had a group. I used to. Who were both teaching at the new school? Yeah, well, I used to play with Chico and Junior's band. It was the same period, and then Rufus called me because he and Akiratana. Put together a group, you know, uh, called Tyler Reed. And it was me and Ralph Moore on the front line. I got to play with them. And because of them uh, recording the record for Concord, that's how I got signed to Concord. So this is about 88? 80. No, I, that's, uh, yeah, it's about 88, 89, around that time. And uh, but there's another there's another funny story um, where I used to go to the Village Gate session all the time, and they, and there was the guy there emceeing Conrad, and you know we kind of didn't take him so serious, but he would always say to me, "Man, I'm gonna call Cedar Walton and tell him that there's a cat here that can play like Bird. I'm gonna call Cedar, man." I say, okay, you do that. You call Cedar. I'll be waiting. And one day, my phone rings and uh, says, hi, uh, may I speak with Jesse Davis speaking? Uh, this is Cedar Walton. And I'm like, yeah, all right. This is, he's like, um, no, I really am Cedar Walton. And you need to. <laughs> Cedar hired me. On a recommendation from this guy, never heard me, never knew me from Adam, 
hired me to do a gig with them at Jazzmobile and then to record at Rudy Van Gelder's. <laughs> that was my first time in the studio. No kidding. Wow. That and was how old were you first... at, at this point? You're what about oh. 27? No, nah, no, no, no. I think I was 23, 20. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I was 23. Uh -huh. You know, I got there in 86. Oh, right, yeah. It only been three years. And I, I felt like I still couldn't play. But the funny thing is, it's like... I'm sure you could, but... I... No, I couldn't. I couldn't. But the funny thing is, it's like the first five years, things just happened. And, you know... um. I got married pretty young, so I I had to jump in, jump right in. And that was one of the first because I I had never been in a professional studio, but a studio really. And so it was a hell of a thing to have to deal with with Rudy. <laughs> oh, I've heard some stories of him. Oh, Rudy really put me through it. He put me through it, and Cedar was patient. And uh, if it wasn't for like Billy Higgins, yeah, because uh, well, I made a lot of mistakes, and this was analog. Uh -huh. I was making a lot of mistakes, but we did the record. And uh, more detail about exactly how Rudy would put you. I only know one story that might give people an idea. I remember Claudio Rodini. Well, told me a story. He was in the studio with our friend Dave Schnitter, and, oh making, boy. and Rudy wore these white gloves, right? He right. White gloves, right. And Rudy was there doing this. So Claudio, without thinking, made the terrible mistake of touching the mic and moving it maybe two inches. Oh God, no! And yeah. He said, "Rudy ran, stopped the cake, ran into yeah. the, ran into the room, screamed at him." Exactly. Five minutes, and Claudio said it ruined. He couldn't play well on that record, you know. Like, yeah, oh. yeah. I believe it. I believe it because we we were we were in the home stretch after I made many mistakes, and you know he he refused to to go digital. He he wouldn't even try it, and uh, so it was analog. And you know, <laughs> yeah, mistakes, mistakes are not tolerated. And in other words, you know, explain to non-musicians. Right? Well, because because and you couldn't record individually. Exactly, you couldn't punch in, you couldn't do any of that stuff. It was, you know, I mean, they had to splice tape and they had to do all kinds of stuff. So time was precious, money was precious. Materials were precious, and and you you know if, if you if you couldn't do it in one one take or two takes, yeah, you would you were a problem, you know, um, and so we made it through pretty much all of the record until the last tune. Um, it's something Cedar did an arrangement on called "At Last Is Music." arrangement he did on that and uh it was terence blanchard was the trumpet player with cedar's trio and i kept screwing up you know um uh because i kept messing up <laughs> on the solo you know uh g g sharp to c, c sharp going to f sharp <laughs> I get messing up the two five, going to F sharp minor. It was crazy, but you know I had I, I hadn't concentrated so much on on playing in G concert. You know F sharp minor a concert or? In G minor, for us it's E. For E flat, okay. In other words. Us is E, so G G concert. 
And and the three six kept giving me problems. I the C sharp to C sharp. Right, right. You know, going to the two five. And and you know, I was kind of learning on the spot. And uh so I made a few mistakes and and you know it, Don Sickler was there. Don and Maroon had already started helping out Rudy. Right. They now are they now actually run the studio. Yeah, now. yeah. When they were there with Rudy. And you know, Don hit the button and and he was talking to Cedars like, okay, well, yeah, you know, do another one. And you know, we have enough of that that we can splice or we can do whatever. And and before he could he could release the button, I hear, where the hell is he to find this guy? He's fucking up the <laughs> oh, no. he's fucking up the session. Where the why did he and 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 so I was like, uh and Terrence Terrence was no help to me. He was just like, hey man. And I'm like, okay. So yeah, I found out what I was made of because I said, well, after Cedar, Cedar was like, well, come on, Jesse. And I'm like, whoa, okay. You got to handle this. You you got to get a handle on this. I made it through it. I figured it out. And uh, we did the record. And uh, yeah, I walked away with some bumps and bruises, but I learned a lot. Now, and, subsequent recordings. Did you have subsequent experiences with Rudy again? No, that was that was it. That was the only time you ever. That was the only time that was it, and uh, you know, from there, um, uh, I was due to do Tyler Reed's record with Concord after the Cedar record. Well, whose record was that? Tyler Reed, Rufus Reed, and Akira Tana. Oh, Tyler Reed, right, right, right. Yes. And so we recorded their record, and this was also in 1989. And uh, once again, don't ask me how or why, I knew I wasn't ready. But Carl Jefferson asked, after that record, he called me in the room and he said, look, young man, I, don't ask me why, I just have a hunch. I'd like to sign you. And, and, you know, he said, you don't have to say anything now, but I'll have my people call you. And and uh, and I just didn't know how to take it because I knew I wasn't ready as a musician, as a sax player, whatever. I knew I wasn't ready. And so, um, you know, I, I reluctantly, and I, I really mean that, I reluctantly signed because I had a, I had, I had a, you had a family, a, a wife, yeah, you know, wife, you, would never... was, you know, so I had a lot of my early experience in New York was and like probably like you and many other guys, thrown in the fire, I just got thrown in the fire, and and uh, you were gonna learn one way or another. Well, yeah, that's um, that's what happened. You know, I mean, I got, um, you know, the guys at Sweet Basil, the first owners, uh, right. Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Tedford and Blake DeDio. Mm. Blake DeDio. I was that was my corner hood, my corner hood, my neighborhood. So right. I, went to the bar, I got you. I got you. And they would just had piano duos because they didn't have a cabaret license. Wow. Yeah, I remember that time too. Wow. Said, when we get the cabaret license, um. We'll, um, we're going to hire you. We're going to get, you can put a band. Ooh, wow. First, we're going to have Blakey and Stan Getz and, says, and then we'll get you in. So they kept true with their promise. Right. I started, um, I was going through so many rhythm sections. Wow. I can was, imagine. I was, yeah, I can imagine. And, you know, I was like, <laughs> finally, I came in and they said, don't hire a rhythm section. They gave me Sundays and Mondays. Wow. I came for like two years. Yeah. So, so they said next week we got a surprise. Don't don't hire anybody for next week. So wow. I went, 
and there's uh Kenny Barron and Ben Riley and Ron McClure. There you go. Couldn't make it. Wow. And the club owner said, listen, if you have trouble playing with these guys, exactly. <laughs> you can find a different career. Yeah, it's not your own. <laughs> guys, these are guys that are unfireable, you know what I mean? Right. So, exactly. Uh, so that that happened and and uh you know, then I had Albert Daly or Tom Harrell or Beautiful man. You know, or, or Ron McClure or Ben. Wow. I learned what uh, Art Farmer said to be so true. And I think that happened to you too. You know, it's like, if you find yourself to be the smartest person in the world, in the room. I like that too. You can find another room. Exactly. And, and so I, like that. I was That's... thinking how much I learned. Yes. Playing with these cats that were but more advanced than I. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. And patient. And patient. For me, for me, that's the, the you know, like, uh, those guys had such patience um, and they tolerated certain things because they knew, they knew, like, like that the potential was there. Right. Even when even when you don't know about your potential, that's, they that's, know. And uh, so I I learned a, a whole lot of lessons about professionalism and ethics and stage you know, stage ethics and how to you know you learn all of the unwritten rules and you you learn how to be a professional musician above all else. And you learn the things that they learned. You know that. You know, you couldn't have known, like Ben Riley having played with Monk and yeah. Rob and these kind of things. One night he said, "Come on, I'm taking you to dinner. I have to run into him in the afternoon at Sweet Basil. Mm-hmm. Both like to come in for a taste of happy yeah. hour." And he says, "You like Chinese food?" He said, "Of course you do. You like all food." <laughs> I'm going to take you to dinner. So when we went to dinner, he said, "There's one thing you're not. There, you know, I don't think you understand the importance of feeling six. Wow. Against the four. Wow. And at dinner, he sat there for wow, an hour. Ben Rock was explaining to me how six fit into this. Right, and right. The bird, you can hear that he's feeling the level that's in the six. Of, of course. And and I had no idea well, at all about that, you know, and and I was a better player after he talked. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I mean, you have to be. I mean, but especially to be with 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 those particular musicians and and Ben was great in any case yeah. but yeah and that yeah and those guys were all like that welcoming um you know and they understood like like uh yeah we can help these cats we can help these cats and and if you were willing they would they would do all they could to help you, you know. Yeah. Um so when you went with Conquer, just to talk about this, people don't realize it now because this is an age where vanity recordings abound, everybody right. can make a record, anything, but you know, it was a big deal. Yeah. They, it was a big deal. It was a big deal because not a not a lot of young guys were signing record deals. We were scared. We, none of us felt like the guys I was running with, none of us felt like we were ready to do that. Because at any any night in New York City, you could go somewhere and hear an incredible jazz giants. And and if 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 you didn't walk away from from any of those show saying to yourself i gotta work on this i gotta do this i gotta do that even even if you went to see a solo piano uh concert you walked away hold up oh boy it's getting me now oh boy well you walked away uh, understanding the beauty of knowing how to segue with with purpose. 
from one tune to the next. Yeah. I mean, I mean you learn something everywhere you went. Your and third tune is like, your first tune, you know, is that kind of kind of thing. Exactly. We didn't think we were ready to be doing anything. I, and uh I mean Art Blakey asked me to go to him with him when wow. I was a teenager, and I didn't take him seriously at all. I thought he was patronizing. I said, That's very nice. He wants to encourage me. That's funny. You know, he wants to you know, he wants to encourage me and and it's nice, but I'm nowhere near ready for that. I mean, I was on the band set with Kenny Dorman, Witten Kelly, but man. never I was I was just hanging on for dear life. Hey man, I believe me, I can dig it. I can dig it. And I know you were playing, but you well, know later, you know what I mean? <laughs> when 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 I was playing with Megan oh. and I was like twenty two, he go passes me in the five spot on the way to the John. And he says, what, I wasn't good enough for you? Ah, you know, I wasn't good enough I for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he could have funny, it. Man. better than me. Why in the world would he ask me? You know what I mean? It was like. That's funny. So, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's also a, a very fine sense of humor as well, you know. I mean, he understood why you would do what you were doing, you know. Well, you know, getting to your career also, this is something we talked about the other day when we were hanging. You know, there's, oh, how do you say it? Like, okay, in those days, if you were with a big record company, people thought that that was like an instant key to a career. Right. And a successful career. But it didn't always work that way. No, I no. Mean, like, for instance, uh, you know, it seemed to be that you needed some kind of human interest story. Right, exactly. To, some kind of narrative, you know. Like like you were with Concord for a while. Uh -huh. And and yet career-wise, I mean, I guess you, you did work and it probably helped you. Oh, no. I, I mean, well, you know. How can I say this? Yeah, I mean, there was a very short period in the beginning. I was with Kanko for 10 years. And there was a very short period of maybe the first three records where I busted my hump trying to play by the rules, our unwritten rules. And, uh, you know, and, um, yeah, they never seemed to pan out the way I wanted them to pan out. And then I started to learn, like, the truth. You know, there's a truth about that stuff. And and uh, some people, some people get whatever first go round. Some people just have something that, you know, warrants further uh, investigation. And, and there are others who may not have that particular allure, um, but, you know, they're out there. And and like I said, there were very few guys, twenty three year olds, signing signing uh, deals uh, by by any of the companies. Let alone, um, Congo was not a scrub co company. It wasn't a major, but um, you know. So, well, it wasn't Columbia or Sony, but it was well, it, of course it wasn't. I mean, but bigger than a lot of things. In fact, it wasn't that much bigger, that much smaller than Blue Note in those days. Yeah, I mean, that's how he wanted it. Carl Jefferson always said that he he never wanted to to be a major label or, or approach that. He was happy where he was. And his intent was to build up the catalog, which is what he did. You know, I mean, and after it was all said and done, Concord boasted 
a pretty pretty serious catalog um and and like a lot of first records were done on concord you know so a lot of a lot of great musicians like a lot of their first records were done on concord either side man or or whatever um but yeah, the catalog, the catalog kept them in in the running. Um, but for me, <laughs> still, once again, it was just all I was learning on the job, you know. And uh, it's the first time I've ever, I guess, even said that to anyone. I was learning on the job, and but what I what what actually I was learning more about myself than anything because my those years at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts and the subsequent years in a couple of three different universities in the music programs, I learned more than I thought I learned. I knew more than I thought I knew. And I had to put it into action. And when it came to putting it into action, I found that, yeah, I can do this. So, you know, I may not have felt ready, but after after maybe the first three or four records, um, I mean, I had been around the block a bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I I felt justified enough to be out here doing the stuff, you know, but um, I mean, I have no regrets about that period, none whatsoever. Um, and I had a chance to work with a lot of great musicians and do a lot of great gigs. Um, so no regrets, you know. The only problem I'm having now is that I have to get prepared cuz I'm leaving to go back to Italy tomorrow and and I have to get prepared to go back pretty soon um yeah we we've been at it <laughs> so you know we'll wrap it up in a moment well I know you know you're good now <laughs> we're chosen you know and I think you realize that life has chosen you to play this music well yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know if it's about life choosing me more, more so than than me understanding what it means to be to play this music and to be a musician, because music is a powerful force, and and once one realizes that there's more to music than music, just for music's sake. And and that you can actually make connections and communicate with other human beings that know nothing about music to yeah. the point where they feel what you feel at any given moment. And that that makes this a very powerful uh gift for all of us. And the you know, the thing is that of course we've talked about the as you put it the other day, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, just the hypocrisy and the double standards right. and the whole things that involve the music business. Like, for instance, when the, when they choose a certain person right. out, uh, the somehow the powers that be or whatever you want to call these mysterious forces that work yeah. in the business, somehow I feel you and I are a little bit similar that way. Right. That we get a bit passed over, not by the other musicians. No, no, no. I, 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 I hear what you're saying. Because you, know, you remind me of uh, your career sometimes looks a little bit like uh, like mine, you know. But I did leave New York. I went to Canada for a number of years because I wanted right. to have and a child, you know. But that's what I remember. Uh, I I would guys would talk about you a lot when they talked about alto players, the the best alto players, and I always thought you were from Canada at first yeah well that <laughs> i had a review once. this is terrible i mean i was um uh, i played a festival and i had kenny Barron and uh ben come up right 
a, 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 another guy, an American who was up there, a bass player named Skip Bay. He really right. wanted to play with Kenny and Ben again. So I, I arranged something at the Ottawa Festival. See? I, my horn broke. Oh, no. Day, and, and somehow I hit a bump and something in the horn. Oh, it, man. It was yeah. played league and nobody could fix it on Sunday. Right. So I, I got through this gig, the concert, and did my best. And I didn't right. play that great. And then the review came out. Mm. And a Canadian altruist, Bob Mover, did his best to keep up with his American cohort. Oh, no. See, so. You know, and that's, like. Yeah, that's you know, our legends are born. I said, wait a minute. I wrote you a letter. I mean, you should know your historical background. Right. I'm. I mean, even if I failed that day, and I You're I'm American. kind of agree no. with you, I am American. If I'd have lived in Africa, yeah, I, the alto player. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm, it was. It no, was I mean, I mean, but you know, yeah, that's how legends are born. But I, you know, I left. Uh, I left New York, and Paul Blay put it the right way. Paul Blay, who said, "There's only so many slots." <laughs> when you leave New York, even if you go. No. I'm going to, to Canada. It's like two hours away. He yeah. said, I as well go to Australia. Well, <laughs> when you're in New York. I got to tell you, I've said that to guys who, who over the years have, they called me and they say, man, how is it living in Europe? I'm thinking about, I said, well, you got two things. Number one, do you know anyone over here? Do you have a reason to move over here? You say, well, no, you know, I'm just feeling a certain place, you know. It feels, I like the vibe. I say, well, you shouldn't move here, you know, because just moving to a place in Europe on your own, other than maybe like England, somewhere where they speak English, you know, you you might encounter, yeah, you know, I mean, it's nice to have a reason, or if you know like a lot of musicians, but... You know, or if you have a, a lady friend, <laughs> makes it easier. And and uh, but I I would also also say to them like like uh, be be aware that you're gonna lose your spot. And I'd say they say, what do you mean? I say, no, you have a spot. You know, it's it's kind of like in in the universe. If 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 a planet explodes, you know, um, well, that dark matter, there's gravity and whatever else, something's going to take that spot. Something's going to move in. You know, I mean, that's, yeah, you have spots. And you work hard to get your space and your rep. Uh, and I'm telling you, when you leave, Somebody's gonna jump right in, cause you got cats who, who don't have those spots. They're the ones looking. You don't look, cause you got a spot. And we used to think I was just it was just like some anecdotal. We said no, it's not. It's true. I heard cats tell me this when I left. I said, man, wow. Now we get to see if 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 some other alto players and get certain gigs. So there were cats looking at me like I was getting all of the breaks. There's always somebody looking at you. You know, I mean, yeah, well, I'm all of the breaks. I mean, like when I decided, personally, I know you got to leave him there, so we'll, we'll, but, um, you know, we, my the daughter's mother, my oldest daughter's mother, was going to have a baby and actually i had a chance to teach at william patterson right but she was canadian and she didn't want to live in oh really new jersey because i was so busy that i wouldn't yeah have to yeah I, I can and yeah. i said well, i don't know if i'm going to do this again in life right let's go have the baby and my good friend charles ellison mm -hmm. the trumpet player in montreal right had, a, had told me if i ever wanted to get off the road concordia university was there beautiful man I did that, and for the first two years, two and a half years, I didn't go on the road because I didn't want my little girl to wonder where's oh, daddy. Hey man, yeah, I got you. I I, to I totally understand. But then you 100%. know, hundred percent. They moved to Toronto, so I moved to Toronto too. But I went to Europe. I had a Walter Davis Jr. with me, and right. I did Europe. I mean, I part of the year, 
you know, yeah. and I do that. But still, I was not in New York. We couldn't get a gig in New York. And, uh, you know, even Walter, as a, as a leader, we couldn't, you know. That's crazy. Couldn't get it. So, you know, the That's thing crazy. is that um, with um, the, the, the world being what it is, I'm going to say in Europe, I may have moved there because of, um, but I couldn't leave because my daughter, we were split up and my daughter was growing right. up. Right. So that kind of kept me there. And then, of course, you know, and then when she, she turned 16, I went back to New York and she went to LaGuardia for a year and my story. But the thing I mean to say is that when you're living in Europe, which you are living in Europe now, which yes. are, I know yes. that, how long have you been actually living over there now? I've been living there for almost 22 years. 22 years. Almost. Oh, that's a while. Mm hmm. So. Oh, oh, there you go. To finish, twenty-two years in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, um, it's 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 more like twenty-one. Actually, it's more like twenty-one. But um, I mean, I've I've been with with my wife for twenty-five years. Wow. You know, we've been together. Um, so. You have children with her? Yes, we have uh, a daughter. She's 18. She'll be 19 this month. And she's an American woman? or No, she's, she's born and raised in Italy. So she's Italian. That's what got you. Yeah, and that's, that's like when you said you decided to stay. I decided to stay, too, because the education was amazing and it's free. Mm. You know, that education, you'd have to pay for that over here. It was amazing, and she was doing so well that it's like, no, no, I'm not going to interrupt her life. Yeah. I, I like, I like the fact that she's growing up here. Yeah, to so yeah. Italiano. Cosa? Italiano. Certo, certamente. <laughs> Cosa? Di parla. In Italia, che io, io cominciavo a parlare italiano. Sì, certo, veramente. Yeah. <laughs> e tutti, But, tutti italiani. Yeah. No, I, uh, I love Italy, you know, I mean, and, you know, for all its problems, and, uh, you know, there's... Uh, Father, devi, devi, uh, sì, cominciare... <laughs> Subito, Italiano, in Italia. Uh, you have to learn as quickly as you can um, because not, well, when I moved there, not a lot of people spoke English. But they're very patient with teaching you the language too. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, at those dinners where you have arguments over, over how to, how to, uh, about the verbs, even be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and the five rules of grammar, you know the five. I mean, it's but yeah, Italians. It as long as you listen to what they tell you when they tell you, yeah, you'll be fine. But they always they always say no, 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 no. So, the thing I find funny about Italians that I love and 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 don't love is um, they tell you that they're doing it your way. See. They proceed to do it their way. Exactly. Certo. Well, they, make, you. It, exactly. <laughs> well, because it's it's that like that old Roman uh way of thinking. You know, if it ain't Roman, it's barbaric. Roman's the center of the world. That's and right. and many Italians feel like, hey, Italy is it. And uh, you know it's a great place with a great culture, and uh, so they feel like, what else do I need? So, are you playing? Um, uh, just two more things. Are you playing a lot in other countries? Yes. While you're living, so you're traveling yes. with local cats in in those countries, or do you get to bring a band? Or well, it depends. It depends on on what the gig is. Um, But most of the time, you know, because times change. It used to be, I used to work 
when when New York had when they'd come, you know, uh, right. guys would let you know and we put something together, and that kind of changed. And then musicians started booking gigs, so there's certain musicians in certain areas of a certain country and a certain clubs and certain. So now what I do, I have I have cats in different parts who put stuff together, and uh, we we choose musicians or in some cases we have guys that we've kind of been together for like 10 years now um and so like that kind of thing but yeah i have cats that i go and play with you know i had three bands and i had some guys up in the north around Milan, right. exactly Ligoria, then toward <laughs> there was another band and then in the south there was another you know, exactly exactly and uh, I mean, that's kind of how you have to be in Europe, period. I mean, you know, um, and it works out. It works out. Uh, so hey, I enjoy it. You got to get back to uh, to Italy tomorrow. Tampa. Oh. Si, si. Un piacere grande. Anche io. Anche yeah. io. Un piacere. Oh. Veramente, Bob. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. I, you know, I, I, I know, I kind of skipped and rewound and did it, did, but the whole point is, you know, um, I appreciate you asking me to do this. Um, it it means something to me. So thank you so much, brother. Thank, thank you. you too, man. You know you're. It's an honor and a pleasure to talk to you and your, you know, your contribution to the music is immense. I think you're one of the Thank guys you, really given something to the music these days. And it isn't like it was, but at least right. like of you. Of course, of course. It is. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate those kind words. I appreciate that because, because what, what this music means to me in particular at this juncture in my life, it's just very profound and deep. And uh, so anytime there's an opportunity to share and play, yeah, it's 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 a profound experience for well, me. You know, playing reflects some profound life experience. And, you know, there are a lot of people who play the saxophone, but there aren't that many poets, and you're one of them. Well, thank you so much, Bob. That's that's very wow. Thank you, absolutely, and so are you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Jesse, and I thank you everybody for watching our podcast on the real side today. Um, please um, give us a like, and um, you can uh, what do they call it? Become a member or a subscriber. I think it's called subscribe it uh it helps us more than you know and it doesn't cost anything yeah, absolutely and um you know we'd like to thank jesse kaiser who's not here at this moment but she's right. uh, gonna be putting this together and once again i really uh, deepest thanks to the great jesse davis for joining us today and bon voyage grazie well, yeah bon viaggio. Exacto, exacto. and um We'll see you again soon. Thank I hope you. so. I hope so, Chief. For sure. Thank Thanks you. a million. Grazie mille. Yeah. Good night and God bless everyone. Good night, Bob. Thank you, baby. Good night.